So our next guest today is a professor from the Medical College of Wisconsin. He holds a PhD from the University of Maryland in Neurophysiology and is a fellow of the California Institute of Technology. He has done extensive research with MRI to examine the neuronal circuits that are related to drugs of abuse and to try and assess the impact of craving, reinforcement, inhibitory control, and decision-making on the brain. His focus at the moment in research is on developing biomarkers to try and individualize treatment and predict the treatment outcomes. He is the chief of neuroimaging research branch of the National Institute of Drug Abuse in the USA. Please welcome Dr. Elliot Stein. While they're setting up, let me uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, and congratulations on this, this beautiful new facility uh, and, uh, and your future. Um, so even though uh, the theme for this uh, symposium is, uh, is opiates, let me use uh, stimulant uh, as an exemplar of some general principles that we think uh, hold for, um, for all uh, substance abuse. And I have no, uh, I have no potential uh, or actual conflict of interest. So let me just state the problem for us for just a moment. We know that as for all above the neck diseases, if you will, there are no um, uh, cl clinical, clinically useful, measurable biomarkers for drug dependence. And if there's no markers, it's impossible to assess the addiction liability uh, of a substance, the severity uh, of that substance, um, not quite going to work, that's okay. Uh, um, or in fact, the, the level of dependence, or if in fact um, we know that our treatment has worked. And I would submit to you, if you can't measure it quantitatively, um, then how can we really fix it? So why is it that addiction um, is, so, is so resistant to treatment? Well, I would posit as a, as a, neuro, as a neuroscientist, that the addicted brain is poorly understood, that we don't understand these neuroplastic consequences to chronic drug use, um, including the initial underlying genetic and epigenetic uh, differences. For the most part, as you know, we're still relying on a symptoms checklist. We're not making a measurement of a blood glucose level or a blood pressure level in our field. So if that's the case, if you buy the fact that we're looking at a disease of neuroplasticity, how would you, in fact, measure that in humans? Well, there are two basic approaches that those of us who do brain imaging uh, take. The first is to begin to look for specific state trait phenotypic differences um, that uh, characterize the addicted individual, and with the hope of, of then using these measures as an indirect biomarker um, that would be a target for our drug treatment um, and interventions. The second method would be to identify specific key networks, key brain circuits that underlie addiction. Again, now in this case, that the working hypothesis is that such circuits will give us a concrete biomarker for therapeutic developments. And I'm gonna spend most of the time today uh, on this second methodology. So where would you begin uh, such an exploration of, of brain-based plasticity? And I'm glad Dr. Guerra presented this, uh, this slide. We did not uh, practice this. Um, uh, but as, as he mentioned to you a moment ago, we look at a, num we look at a number of intrinsic um, um, uh, normal brain mechanisms that become, uh, that become altered as a consequence of this, uh, of this cyclic behavior. And I want to emphasize um, uh, the aspect that I'll be talking about today, and that's these neuroadaptations, these changes in circuits that we believe fundamentally are, if you will, switched in the presence of this, as, as, a, uh, as a result of this disease, and therefore potential targets for which we will then aim for our treatment. So let me just use, as I said, cocaine dependence as an exemplar. Most of us remember this from from medical school uh, and, and other uh, training. We know that uh, preclinically the models are very, uh, very compelling of the compulsive nature of cocaine dependence. In humans, we know that the, um, that the recidivism rate is very high, uh, often at least 70% or, or greater. And this loss of control um, 
that we see in these individuals is behavioral rigidity, reward disturbances, mood disturbances. The slide from Luan Fan that, that was pointed out in the, last, uh, in the last speaker all emphasize elements within the so-called mesocortical limbic dopamine system uh, consistent with these preclinical models. So I'm going to be using that as a framework to begin to explore uh, brain changes with you. And I'll ask the question, to what extent do these local neuroadaptations lead to systems level circuit plasticity, um, uh, including the, the functions within and between the so-called mesolimbic structures? So what brain circuits then identify uh, cocaine dependence? And what method would we use to, tra to, to measure circuitry in humans non-invasively? In non and the method that we use is something called functional magnetic resonance imaging, functional MRI. And basically, it's a, it's, it's a big word for a reason, reasonably simple method. What we do is we, um, we put people in, a, in an MRI, and we tell them, don't move. That's the experimental design. And we take a measurement for between 10 and 12 minutes or so. And we're looking for spontaneous, that is to say non-directed activity, in the individual's brain at rest, much like you would do a resting blood pressure measurement. And if you take a look at that brain signal that's coming out, we look for, these, we look for synchronized, whoops, synchronized uh, fluctuations in this rest, uh, resting uh, signal. And basically what we think about is, for example, if we were to take a look at, uh, depicted here, uh, a piece of uh, sensory motor cortex, and we just look at these spontaneous fluctuations, and we ask the question, are there any places in the brain that have similar random, what seems to be random fluctuations? And we would call that, we would look, uh, use that uh, hypothesized area, a so-called seed, and look every place in the brain for areas that have similar fluctuations. In this case, the contralateral um, um, sensory motor cortex as an exemplar. Ah. Uh, and when we do that, if we ask which areas in the brain have similar spontaneous fluctuations, the answer in this case would be um, bilateral sensory motor cortex. So we're asking for, it, uh, is there something about the sound waves coming out of my mouth that then bounce across your ear and have coherence? Right? Simple me method, and that's the method I'm going to be using throughout the talk. And the framework that I'm going to be using, this is also comes from, from, from Nora Volkoff and, and George Kube, um, just uh, redone in another manner, is to, is to use this basic framework to begin to explore uh, cortical striatal um, involvement, amygdala and insular involvement, hippocampal involvement. So this will be my framework as I move through uh, the talk. And we began this, this uh, episode right at the, at the time that functional MRI was beginning, and we asked a very simple question, are there differences in these so-called mesocortical circuits um, in cocaine addicts versus healthy controls? And we put seeds then along the mesocortical limbic um, uh, pathway. And what I'm plotting for you here are those areas that are coherent, that have the same pattern um, between the seed and target areas in the brain as a function of healthy controls and cocaine addicts. When we do the math, and I just show you th those areas that are different, we begin to see circuits that represent differences between cocaine addicts and healthy controls, and I point out, and I'll come back to today, circuits such as the amygdala intermedial prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus intermedial prefrontal cortex. And when we plot, for example, that circuit between the VTA and the nucleus accumbens, the weak of the circuit um, um, uh, correlates with the, the intensity or the number of years that that individual has been using cocaine. And so basically, um, we began to come up with our own circuitry that seem to suggest um, difficulties, as we know, behaviorally, in appropriately activating reward and learning circuits in these individuals. And again, begins to give us, begins to give us targets upon which we can uh, aim our treatment. In a study that was just published last year, um, one of the postdocs in our lab asked the question, was there a relationship between basic behavioral constructs that we think about in addiction um, and brain circuitry. 
And he specifically was interested in impulsivity, as we know, uh, a risk factor for and something worse, worsened by uh, drug use. It's a key factor in recidivism. And he also then asked about compulsivity, which, as we know, is in fact the sine qua non, the hallmark uh, of addiction. And five of the seven diagnostic criteria in the last version of DSM concern the compulsive use uh, of, of drug. And so we thought maybe we could quantify these five uh, compulsive drug use symptoms. And now we're um, using our, our framework, we're going to be looking at uh, striatal, striatal cortical uh, networks. And the hypothesis was that cocaine users would have altered striatal um, um, cortical circuitry, uh, and that we would begin to identify specific circuits related to impulsivity and compulsivity in this disorder. The experiment was very simple. We collected data from uh, about 40 uh, cocaine individuals in healthy controls. And what Yu Zhang did was he put seeds in specific areas of the dorsal and ventral striatum, and then asked the question, where in the brain are you talking to? And is it related to impulsive and compulsive uh, properties? And what Yu Zhang identified was a number of circuits two of which I'm going to emphasize today, and that's from the ventral striatum, the inferior division, um, into the, the dorsal uh, anterior cingulate, where there was a reduction in that circuitry um, in cocaine users. And then another circuit here in the dorsal uh, caudate um, to uh, dorsal bilateral dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, where that circuit was, in fact, stronger in cocaine addicts than in healthy controls. Well, why would that be? Well, when we took a look at the relationship of these circuits with impulsive behaviors, in this case, this bilateral uh, dorsal caudate to um, DLPFC, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, there was a relationship, a direct relationship between the strength of this circuit um, and both current cocaine use uh, and the individual's impulsivity. And this is a very similar uh, situation as was reported by uh, like uh, Karen Ursh a number of years ago, in that this area of the dorsal caudate um, uh, signaled the uh, change in impulsive, um, uh, impulsivity in cocaine addicts. So pretty good coherence of, these, of the two data sets. Well, what about compulsivity? And the hypothesis here is that, for example, similar to a, to a car, it would be we, we wouldn't be seeing a single circuit. What we'd be looking at is the balance between the accelerator and the brake, if you will. And so the hypothesis then was, if we took a look at the circuitry between ah, the, this, the, that I just showed you, this ventral striatum and the dorsal ACC, and the more superior uh, part of the ventral striatum and the medial prefrontal cortex, and that the difference, the difference between these circuits would represent the change in compulsive behaviors in these cocaine addicts. And indeed, um, the stronger the difference of the circuit, the more compulsive symptoms uh, cocaine, addicts, uh, cocaine addicts displayed. So impulsivity, uh, uh, then both a risk factor uh, and a consequence of cocaine use is associated with an increase in dorsal striatal uh, frontal connectivity, uniquely in cocaine addicts. And this compulsive cocaine use, um, a defining, a defining characteristic of the disease, is associated with an imbalance between so-called go and stop circuits. So if that's the case, the next question we wanted to ask was, can striatal circuits then serve as a biomarker for cocaine treatment and treatment outcome? So let me just emphasize um, that that extensive, extended cocaine use, as we move from, um, uh, from, from uh, uh, so-called volitional use to compulsive and habitual drug taking, there's a shift in the brain from control circuitry um, under, uh, under um, uh, sal incentive salience um, circuitry from the ventral striatum to more, to more habit-based um, uh, stereotopy in the dorsal striatum. And so the hypothesis then going in was to take seeds in the nucleus accumbens, the caudate, and the putamen in the striatum, and that we would see differences emerge 
um, in the strength of corticostriatal circuitry that would predict, predict treatment outcome. So in order to do this, we, we uh, uh, collaborated with a, with a colleague at the University of Texas Southwestern, uh, Brian Adenoff, a postdoc in my lab, uh, Meredith McHugh, uh, did all the data analysis. And we had 45 uh, cocaine individuals in a residential treatment unit. And just before discharge, we put them in an MRI. And we had, in this case, six minutes of resting, of resting data. Uh, we did the full uh, neurocognitive clinical battery, matching healthy controls. And we followed these individuals for up to 24 weeks after treatment. And it turned out that, when we, and, and so for the purposes of this talk, I only want to talk about the, the status outcome at 30 days, so-called early remission, according to DSM. And it turned out after 30 days, this 45 uh, um, uh, individuals, we had about half and half, about half relapsed and half didn't relapse at 21 day, at, uh, uh, at 30 days. So that's my outcome measure that I'm going to be looking for a brain signal. And we put, our, we put our seeds, as I said, within the putamen, nucleus accumbens, and caudate, and only the putamen, and only a circuit between the putamen and the posterior insula was able to predict the treatment outcome. We asked the question, does that circuit um, um, predict impulsivity of these individuals retrospectively? And the answer was yes. The weaker that circuit, the more um, impulsive these individuals were based on the Barrett impulsivity um, um, a measure. And then we, we also asked if this circuit actually mediated the outcome, the outcome of impulsivity uh, to addiction, and it did. The circuit fully mediated the relationship between impulsive behavior and uh, addiction status. Well, why the, why the um, why the insula? This was a whole brain search. We only started with the butamen and had no idea where the circuit was. Right? The circuit turned out to be here in the posterior insula. And if you think back to, 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 um, to, to neuroanatomy, um, we mostly ignored the insula in, in those days. It was kind of tucked inside the brain. What was it doing? Um, in this nice summary by uh, Bud Craig a few years ago, he talked about the, um, the continuum within the insula from posterior to anterior, where the posterior insula seems to be mostly involved in interoception, interoception, as well as homeostatic regulation, inputs from the hypothalamus and the amygdala. And so we think that this uh, circuit uh, seems to confer some vulnerability to the development of addiction. Importantly, importantly, in, in neither in this study or any of the others I'm going to show you, were any, was there any relationship with any of the standard clinical assessments that we do with our patients. There was no relationship with years of use, I mean, with uh, years of education, years of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, drug use, I should say, cigarettes a day, days of cocaine use. There was no relationship except for this brain circuit. OK, so let's walk up that circuit. That was, that was a striatal uh, circuit. Let's take a look at the involvement of the, um, uh, uh, of the uh, amygdala. And why the amygdala? Because it's associated uh, with, uh, as you heard from the last talk, with cocaine-related, and, and in fact, other drug-related cues and craving, anxiety, reaction to stress. Uh, these individuals show disrupted uh, amygdala uh, frontal cortical regulation. And we know from, uh, from neuroanatomy that there isn't a single construct uh, structure uh, known as the amygdala. It has two major divisions the so-called basolateral uh, division uh, and the cortical medial division with very discrete uh, inputs and outputs. And so we put seeds in both of these divisions. And for the sake of time, let me simply say that the, we had two hypotheses going in, that there would be an enhanced connection between the basolateral division and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, and that would predict relapse uh, risk. And there would be a reduced connection between the cortical medial and the ventral, ventral medial PFC, and that would uh, um, uh, support relapse. So again, a seed in each of these two areas, whole brain, whole brain connectivity, and ask the question, which circuits predicted outcome? And the answer was only two circuits. From the cortical medial to, in fact, the ventral medial PFC, 
um, those, uh, was weaker in those who relapsed versus those who did not. A circuit very similar to the very first slide, if you can remember back 10 minutes ago, uh, where we saw a decrease in cocaine, uh, in cocaine users between the amygdala and ventral medial PFC. And then a circuit between the basal lateral nucleus and visual cortex that seemed to be protective. In this case, individuals that did not relapse had a weaker circuitry. Again, there was no relationship with any of the standard clinical characteristics that we, that we measured. Did, none of them predicted the treatment outcome. How good were we at, pre at predicting the outcome? Out of, we were at about 70, 73% accuracy, simply by looking at these two circuits. And a conversation for later, perhaps, in our, in our um, discussion period this afternoon is, is that good enough? Is that good enough uh, clinically? And, and, I, and we'll, we'll have a couple of uh, thoughts about that. OK, moving up our circuitry, now let's take a look at the hippocampus. And why the hippocampus? Because we know that this area is involved in associations that are produced uh, during the, uh, well, for many purposes, but in our case now, for, for drug, uh, drug self-administration, for drug taking. And these neuroadaptations are involved in condition responses. You heard this just a bit uh, from Dr. Guerra a minute ago. Um, and it's these stimuli in the absence of drugs that leads to cue-induced drug cravings and then, uh, and then subsequent drug taking. So our hypothesis was that individuals who relapse would show changes in, oh, I should say, so the other way to measure brain activity is to look for standing neuronal activity, if you put an EEG electrode on, or in our case, again, from an MRI standpoint, we looked at changes in blood flow and metabolism. So this is a, a measure of, of regional cerebral blood flow indicating changes in neuronal activity. Okay? So we would see changes in neuronal activity in the hippocampus uh, that would be related to, uh, to treatment outcome, and that these circuits uh, between these regions would be disrupted uh, in the relapse group. So again, in this case, we did a whole brain search and asked which areas do we see tonic brain activity changes as measured by changes in regional cerebral blood flow related to the treatment outcome. And the answer was posterior hippocampus. And in, the, in this case, those who relapsed, there's an increase in basal firing in the hippocampus, this region that's involved in binding the condition uh, effects of, of drug taking. We then said, OK, that's kind of interesting. This area, is, we have an increase in neuronal activity. Who is it talking to? So we did another analysis and asked, again, a whole brain search. Who are you talking to as a function of relapse? And that turned out to be a piece here in the posterior cingulate, um, an area in the so-called default mode network that also predicted uh, outcome. When we put both of these together um, and did an ROC curve, we can predict, again, uh, predict accuracy at 30 days at about 75%. At 60 days out, again, about 75, 76%. So not too bad. Two, one circuit and one area of the brain. Again, no ability to predict, to predict uh, uh, using clinical measures. And interestingly, we did not see any changes in any of the mesocortical limbic dopamine regions um, as a predictor. It was only the hippocampal basal activity. Last, uh, last study to, to review. This one just came out a few weeks ago uh, in brain. And we wanted to ask the question now, most of our predictions are being done within the, popu the treatment population. That's a little bit cheating, right? You'd like to get a, a measure that gen generalized from one uh, source and then make sure that that generalizes across all populations. <clears throat> so in this case, we took a non-treatment-seeking population, and we asked a slightly different question in these cocaine addicts. Are there any regions in the brain where the thickness, the cortical thickness, the gray matter thickness differed in cocaine addicts as, a, as uh, compared to healthy match controls? And we found th um, three, two areas, actually bilateral areas, that in fact uh, did um, uh, demonstrate a difference. These are not predictors. Differences are not predictors. In both left and right insula, 
as well as left and right temporal pole, which surprised us, there was a thinning, there was a decrease in cortical gray matter in cocaine addicts versus controls. We then took those areas as a mask and applied them in the treatment population that I showed you a moment ago. So this is a completely independent population. In that population, each of these were, were seeds. And we did a connectivity analysis. And then we looked at the difference in those connectivities. And it turned out that, um, that, the, um, that the insula to, meet, to uh, dorsal anterior cingulate, an area we've seen just a few minutes ago, as well as between the temporal pole and frontal cortex were different between these two, these two groups. And specifically between the temporal pole and the medial frontal cortex, um, there was a relationship between cocaine use uh, and the circuit strength between these two areas. And once again, um, predicted, predicted um, uh, treatment outcome at about 70 to 75 percent. What was really nice about this study is we used an anatomic difference, something that occurred as a consequence, presumably, of cocaine use, and then used that as a predictor in a novel population. So what have I told you today? I've told you that there are a number of biological markers that we believe um, uh, represent uh, risk for early relapse. And this has been predicted by a reduction in connectivity strength between the putamen and the posterior insula a reduction in the circuit between the cortical medial amygdala and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. There's been a high, there's a higher um, activity in the hippocampus, in the parahippocampal gyrus, a higher connectivity between this posterior hippocampus and the posterior cingulate, and a reduced connectivity between the temporal pole and medial prefrontal cortex. So these findings we would submit, I would submit to you then, are, are, are in support, then, of brain regions involved in the consolidation and perhaps reconsolidation of this cocaine, cocaine cues and cocaine cue-induced um, uh, craving and, and drug-seeking. So all of this that I've shown you so far is, is retrospective, right? It's, it's not predictive, but, but post-ictive, right? The next step really is to take these data and to put our money where our mouth is and to use these as predictors uh, going into a de novo um, a treatment study. And so what my lab is now uh, in the process of doing is a number of things. The first is I showed you a number of different independent, perhaps independent, markers of addiction uh, treatment outcome. Can we make a composite measure? Can we give a physician, after all, what you want when you're making a diagnosis is you want to know 220 over 110. You want to know when that 220 goes down to, goes down to 150. You want to see that 150 go down to 110. And you want to be able to say, congratulations, you no longer have hypertension. You need that number. And so part of my goal now in, the, in my lab is to try to combine these markers into a single number that ultimately can be used uh, as an outcome uh, predictor of which we know how much treatment and what treatment is going to be efficacious. We then want to take this, uh, this concept and use this um, and get some predictive validity, as I said, uh, going into um, uh, a study um, a priori rather than postictive. And perhaps the best way to do that then would be to, to do a specific uh, intervention, a causal mechanistic intervention, if I in fact think that this particular circuit or circuits are different and predictive of that disease, then that, that's my treatment outcome. That's my, my target. And so how do I target that specific circuit and watch that circuit as the blood pressure goes down from 220 to 110? And one way potentially to do that is with this novel, no, sorry, this novel intervention called transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. As you know, it's been approved in the US by the FDA uh, for depression. It's not been approved for any other uh, neuropsychiatric disorder. And we're beginning to look at this uh, in both cocaine uh, and smoking uh, addiction in my lab. So that would be a mechanistic way to causally uh, reverse uh, these circuits. And then the last thing that we're trying to do in my lab, and as you know 
uh, much better than I as, as treatment providers, there's no such thing as a smoker, a, a, a cocaine user, an opiate user. It's an individual with comorbidities, as you heard just a few minutes ago. It's the anxious smoker or the depressed smoker, whatever it might be. And so we need to then be able to give you, as treatment providers, something that you can do a differential diagnosis, not simply the 220 over, over 110, but some way to then say, is this a kidney problem? Is this a vascular problem? What, how do we then differentially diagnose that and allow you to use um, a specific tailored treatment intervention? So that's the long-term goal. I just want to thank um, the individuals in my lab. I've tried to highlight some of the folks along the way um, that did all of the work. Uh, Xu Zhuan Gang uh, in that last study, M Meredith McHugh, my treatment collaborator, Brian Adenoff, uh, and a number of, of just really talented psychiatrists, uh, image processors, uh, and neuroscientists uh, who've made this possible. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stein. I think we have time for a few questions there, if anybody in the audience has any. While we're waiting on that, Dr. Stein, can you tell us uh, half of our clients that we see are, have problems with heroin? Have you known much research, and is it similar pathways that you see in heroin? So, so yes. So the question is, uh, are there commonalities between heroin addiction and um, the exemplar that I use today, stimulant uh, abuse? And we believe the answer is yes, that the commonalities are... Um, are um, perhaps a completely overlapping, that we can think of this as, as these different pharmacologic agents ultimately uh, coming in from different pathways, but um, uh, coalescing on a common series of structures, as you notice from, from the George Kube and, and Nora Volkov uh, um, model, uh, and the model I used, there was no drug there. It was all addiction, and we believe that the, the fundamental circuits that are, in fact, dysregulated um, are the same um, no matter what. Uh, my lab has not uh, yet begun, we're just beginning um, a, uh, uh, an, an opiate um, uh, treatment study right now, uh, actually using uh, impaired physicians as our, um, as our subjects. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, um, at least in the States, most of, the, uh, of those individuals have about a 70 to 75 percent uh, success rate, so very high. Uh, and so they're being used as our target population to develop these interventions. Excellent, that'll be very useful for us. And just one quick question there before you go. The, um, I think I just saw somebody else wanted to ask a question. I'll let the lady there go. Okay, can, can you hear me? Um, excellent presentation, lots of food for thought. I'm, can you hear me? Is that better? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm a neck downwards kind of scientist, taking the easy route. Um, it does seem to be that there are a lot of common circuitry between binge eaters and, uh, y you know, uh, what you're sh showing us right here. I mean, I'm, I'm an obesity scientist, and that's my area of expertise. But it really does look like these are, there are, there's a huge amount of redundancy in these circuitries. Is, uh, could you comment on that? I'm not sure what you mean by redundancy. Um, um, okay. Uh, you, you lack asked, of specificity, perhaps. Ah, so, so we would think that the, the um, as I was just answering a moment ago, that the specificity of the disease, that the ult ultimately, for example, um, uh, there may be multiple causes, multiple directions to get to um, um, uh, a dysregulated organ system. There's multiple routes to get a dysregulated kidney or dysregulated cardiovascular system, but at the end of the day, the cardiovascular system is the one that we're targeting. And so we think that there are, in fact, fundamental circuitry, as outlined by, um, uh, by George Kube, Nora Volkov, uh, a lot of the work of, of Trevor Robbins that, that I was schematically go, uh, showing you, and a lot of homology. Uh, fortunately, from the preclinical models, which we know a lot about, where we can do much more interventional uh, kinds of work, that, these, that the same circuitry, ultimately, these are very old phylogenetic circuits. These are not newly evolved, except for, of course, some of the frontal circuitry, that there seems to be something very fundamental in this circuitry involved in addictive behaviors. Thank you very much for that question. One last question before you leave. How far away do you think we are from getting that magic number, the biomarker? Uh, the number is 12. 
Yeah, so, so how far away are we? That's, that's, that's great. The problem is not the, the lack, unfortunately, the lack of patience. The, the problem is, is um, the lack of the data, um, brain-based data. Um, these are expensive studies to do. It, it's not, uh, it's not uh, very straightforward, and most treatment centers do not have um, access to um, expensive MRIs and, and, and expensive uh, engineers and, and, and physicists to, to do the, the data analysis. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the algorithm, and this is not, you know, not really picking on any, the, the, the basic algorithm every place in the world is we randomize people into a clinical trial. 10% perhaps or so might be successful. And uh, we shake their hands and say, uh, have a nice life, congratulations. 80 or 90% are unsuccessful. Uh, we re-randomize them into another study. And, and, and uh, what did we learn about addiction? We learned nothing from either the successes or the failures. And so in my mind, we need to be able to apply quantitative biological tools uh, against which we can now um, uh, follow this trajectory and understand why the successes were successful. Are we going to be able to get that then? When are we going to get that? Is, is I suppose, to some extent, uh, you know, going to be related to, to how many individuals we can, we can put into machines. The reason we know 220 is a bad number and 110 is a good number is because we have, we have, an epi we have a huge numbers of epidemiologic outcomes, right? We have millions and millions of people. We know 220 is bad. We don't have that anything close to that in addiction. So I'm, I'm not optimistic that it's going to happen in the next few years. Hopefully NARFA will be able to contribute to that. I, that, would be wonderful. that would be wonderful. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You. Stein, everyone.